Hello everyone, this is Professor Alpert, and I'm here today with an extra video for you. Hi there! Every so often I'm going to make videos like these where I respond to issues that come up in the comments. There are generally two sorts of things that I want to respond to. One are big issues that caught one person, or two people, and I want to make sure that they don't trip up anybody else. The other time is when there is a question that a lot of people have, and I want to make sure that everyone can hear the answer instead of me just replying individually to everybody. So today's topics include kind of a mix of both of these things. We're going to be talking about evolutionary ideas about kinship and why they are bad. We'll be talking about what we can learn from when relationships go wrong and we have things like divorce or disowning. We'll be talking about the gender binary and the sex binary because it turns out these are social constructs. Finally, I want to talk about biologizing motherhood, which is to say that motherhood is a social role. It's a set of practices. And a lot of times we imagine that the ability to do all of the mother things is a free gift that comes with having a uterus, but that's actually not very accurate. Let's start with the evolutionary ideas about kinship. So in the 19th century, a lot of scholars discovered different kinship systems like Morgan, right? And what they assumed actually was not just that they were different, but rather that they represented different points of cultural evolution in the understanding of human relations. So according to these scholars, as humans got more sophisticated and scientific and their cultures evolved, they got more precise in their understanding of sex, paternity, and family structure. So they would look at a system like Hawaiian, where there are very few kin terms, where there's almost no differentiation, if there is any, between collateral and lineal relatives, and say, okay, this is, this is early, this is unevolved. And then they they would look at something like the Yanomamo kin terms and say, okay, well, they're, they're a little bit clearer on who parents are, so this is clearly the next step in evolution. And then they'd look at something like English and say, ah, now they have it figured out. So usually these scholars also imagined that humans existed in a state of primordial promiscuity and thus prioritized motherhood. And so this is the reason that they think um, a kinship system like Hawaiian would not have differentiated between different relatives because it's a state of primordial promiscuity. How are you supposed to know who your dad is? Maybe everyone's your dad. Maybe everybody your age is a brother or sister. Who knows? But as humans got smart enough to understand men's role in procreation, they naturally evolved to a patrilineal or patriarchal system. Okay, so why is this view of kinship bad? There are some theoretical reasons. So for example, if we follow Levi-Strauss and we believe that the incest taboo is where nature merges into culture, then how can we account for humans who inherently have culture living in a state of primordial promiscuity? It just wouldn't happen. The thing about humans is that we have rules. There are also factual reasons, like we're just pretty sure it didn't happen. There's evidence from archaeology about the lives of people who lived a long time ago. We have ethnography of foraging societies that use these kinds of kin terms like Hawaiian, and they're not living in a state of promiscuity. There's just no reason to believe that this was actually true. And also, like I just said, kinship systems associated with primordial promiscuity are still in use. So people still speak Hawaiian, but if you went to Hawaii looking for that kind of party, you'd probably be really disappointed. People in Hawaii are just normal. The contemporary understanding of culture is that it doesn't evolve into higher forms. There's no low culture or high culture. There's no primitive culture or civilized culture. Rather, all human culture is incredibly 
complicated. If you're a human, you live a complicated life. And different cultures are different, not necessarily better or worse. Let's move on to the cheery topic of divorce and disowning. Relationships go badly. That's just a fact about life, and it's unfortunate when that happens, but it does. And every person probably has at least one consanguineous family member that they can't stand, that they might at the very least prefer not to interact with, if possible, or that they might have even gone so far as to cut off to say, you're not part of my life anymore. So first of all, if blood is thicker than water, this wouldn't happen, right? Consanguineous relationships would all be wonderful and good and loving because that naturally follows from sharing blood. So this is further evidence that the blood is thicker than water idea is wrong. But also, in the case of divorce, let's think about it from a Levi Strauss point of view. If women are gifts, divorce is returning the gift. Levi Strauss is interested in creating this really nice diagrammable structure of exchanges that looks really symmetrical and cool, but reality is more complicated than a diagram. A diagram is a simplified understanding. Right. Um, and some of you actually said this about Levi Strauss, that he is trying to look at things from a really like bird's eye airplane view. But down on the ground, Levi Strauss is not necessarily the theorist we want to be turning to. Looking at systems of any kind gives us the feeling that kinship is a fixed state of being. It encourages us to ignore that relationships are always being negotiated and renegotiated and sometimes ended. So I just want you to think critically and remember that life is rarely obvious, but that if you look around you, you are full of data about all of these issues that we're talking about this semester because you are humans and you are not alone. All right, let's talk about the gender binary and the sex binary. Neither of these is real. By real, I mean biologically real. Certainly every social construct is real and both of these are social constructs, but because they're social constructs and not features of human biology, they are not inevitable. They can change. They can be understood differently at different points in history, and they can be understood differently in different cultures around the world. So remember that while the gender and the sex binary may be very important to you as a person who grew up with these ideas, that not everybody agrees with you that this is how the world is organized, and that scientists don't agree with you that this is how the world is organized. So, every culture has at least two genders, but many have more. This is true both historically and in the present and all around the world. Some of the most famous and most studied examples are the hijras of India and also Native American two-spirit categories. Both of these resemble the contemporary Western concept of transgender, but they're also different to it. They are perhaps better understood as third genders or fourth genders or fifth genders, depending on the society. Many cultures provide procedures for transitioning from one social gender role to another. So check out the Balkan and Albanian sworn virgins who start as women, but who become socially recognized as men by virtue of taking a vow. Body modification techniques like castration, which is often part of becoming a hijra, have been performed for centuries, dare I say millennia. And it's actually normal for human understandings of gender to be nuanced and complicated instead of rigid and inflexible. As for the sex binary, 
it's not, again, biologically real. It's still a social construction. It still matters for your lives. It still matters for how the people around you are understanding the world, but it's not a biological reality. And let's talk about why. There are lots of parts of the human body that combine to create the appearance of a male body and a female body. These involve sex chromosomes, but also hormonal profiles and responses to hormones, and also which body parts you wind up with as a result of all of this. And all of these things are used to determine sex, but they don't always line up neatly into two categories for a variety of reasons. There are an array of conditions that we refer to as intersex that may account for as many as 2% of the population, which be makes being intersex about as common as having red hair. It's a minority, but it's a normal kind of human variation. And when we talk about intersex conditions, we can see that, first of all, the idea that everybody has XX or XY chromosomes is wrong. Some people have one X, some people have XXY, some people have XY chromosomes, but for hormonal reasons, um, they come out with bodies that look female. So do we decide gender or sex by the chromosomes or do we decide it by the body? And if you really, really want to dig deep into this and blow your mind, here is a classic Twitter thread from a sex biologist who actually studies this stuff and who can tell you in detail why it's wrong. Here is a screenshot from that thread if you want to look at it with some of the conclusions. But the takeaway point from actual sex biologists who know the most about this is that grouping all humans into two rough categories without taking account of important biological variations misrepresents humans pretty badly and is bad science and can result in bad outcomes, actually, if doctors are working with an understanding of humans as just male or female. Okay, finally, motherhood actually isn't as natural as you probably think. First of all, growing a new human inside your body is a really complicated biological, social, and personal experience that lots of people have different reactions to because different people are different, right? There are also phenomena like postpartum depression, which is real. Pregnancy hormones are really intense, and the after effects can create some really serious emotional conditions that often make new mothers feel terrible because you're supposed to be happy after you give birth, not profoundly and dangerously depressed. Also, caring for children requires specific skills that humans aren't born knowing even when it comes to seemingly natural acts like breastfeeding. It's just that older mothers have been teaching this stuff to younger mothers throughout human history. In this day and age, if your mom doesn't know how to teach you, you can hire a lactation coach, and people do. Also, amongst primates more broadly, including humans, there are these things called allomothering practices, like babysitting. Allomothering just means when somebody who isn't the mother takes care of infants. And allomothering helps to teach parenting skills. New mothers with allomothering experience in the primate world do better, their kids survive more, than mothers who don't have this experience. So it just goes to show you that even amongst other primates who aren't humans, learning matters for knowing how to be a mom. So I think that's everything I have to say. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and thank you for listening.